back today, and we are going to talk about uh, and derive, uh, basically, how we can describe or energetically describe how polymers will swell uh, or extend or collapse in different solvents uh, and the different kind of energetic contributions there. So we've talked about this uh, previously. We've kind of described alpha fairly hand wavy, but today we are going to get into Paul Flory uh, and his uh, basically. We're going to see Flor, uh, named Flory a lot. We're going to see Flory Huggins theory in the next lecture, but we're going to talk about him because uh, he's a polymer physicist winner and a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, and his derivation of kind of this swelling and this entropic spring restoring force and excluded volume contributions, um, that is going to kind of highlight our never ending battle with Gibbs free energy in this course. So let's go ahead and uh, get started on how alpha and see how basically alpha will control whether we have a good solvent or bad solvent, how that leads to a change in our n scaling for our root mean squared and n distance. So that's the focus of kind of this derivation. So remember, don't get lost, too lost in the math. Keep a high level description or um, description of what's happening here. So we are going to start uh, basically from our unperturbed state when alpha is equal to one. So we know when alpha equals one, we're in the theta solvent, we're in the melt. We know that we are dealing with an r squared to one half equals r or n to the one half l c infinity square root or some you know square root. Anyways, uh, you know those uh, basically going back through our notes and looking at that uh, chemist chain model and how we can describe uh, those values. It actually is to the square root. Anyways, um, so we are going to start from our kind of random coiled state and we are going to move towards this swollen state. So when we put it in a good solvent where alpha is greater than one, we will now see our chain is going to be extended and that's what we're going to describe. What is the energetic transition from this state to this state? So, uh, and again, this should be a larger end-to-end -end distance. So what are the contributions energetically uh, that, that happen here? Well, there's two primary contributions to polymer swelling. So there's an entropic or an elastic contribution and an enthalpic contribution. So let's think about the entropic first. And we call this an entropic spring or entropic restoring force. So again, very similar to your law, x. So let's think about what happens. What's going on entropically with this transition from state one, from here, our spaghetti, to this state? What's happening to entropy? Well, our entropy, delta s, is decreasing, right? My number of microstates in one versus my number of microstates in two is much, 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 much larger. So this is not favorable en uh, energetically. We want, let's just have our equation, we just have this tattooed on ourselves. Uh, we want energy to decrease. So we want our entropy to be as large as possible. So we don't want, entropically, this is not a favorable state for us to be in. State two is bad. So entropically, we are gonna want to uh, basically restore we want to compress and coil in order to maximize our configuration states. So there's going to be an entropic restoring force on this polymer that basically wants to push it back into the coiled state. So that's why we call it kind of this entropic spring or entropic restoring force here. Because when we pull on the polymer or the polymer swells, we are biasing our distribution. So we no longer, uh, we look, remember back to our probability distributions, we want to be basically centered around the mean there. But now when we swell, we're basically biasing, we're forcing it to be in this, un, you know, again, probability uh, distribution, this unfavorable r squared to the one half, this unfavorable distance, or, you know, this unfavorable configuration, that's a low probability. So if we look at the energetic state as a function of r, this is gonna be, it's basically gonna be inverted. Very, very high energetic state, that's not, uh, that is gonna be very much less probable. Uh, than what we're going to be dealing with here. So when we swell, we decrease the number of microstates, decrease entropy, that is not good. So it will want to restore and spring back into its kind of foiled configuration. So uh, I think we all have a good understanding of that. I describe it numerous times, many times repetitively in the notes, but again, I want to hammer home that point. So what about in these two states, in this transition from this to this, what about the enthalpic contribution? Because again, we have to have our H S. What about our enthalpic contributions? Why do we go from this one to two enthalpically? Well, 
actually there's a driving force enthalpically to go to this state, right? Because if we put our polymer one into a solvent that is good, alpha greater than one, we know that we have favorable energetic interactions, monomer solvent interactions that are low in energy. Thus, my delta H decreases and my energy decreases. That's the enthalpic contribution that we're going to be doing, uh, dealing with here. So when we're in a good solvent, we want to maximize those interactions, lower our energy, and that's um, in a theta solvent, in one, our delta H, we've kind of said previously, is zero. So we are an ideal state. The monomer and the solvent are effectively the same. So there's no favorable energetic, energetic contributions. There's no unfavorable ones. So it's zero. So it just wants to maximize the entropy in that ideal state. But when we introduce it to a good solvent or bad solvent, this enthalpy contribution is going to change. So our total free energy then will just be, thankfully and nicely, picked on the wrong one, it's going to have two contributions, this entropic contribution and then an enthalpic contribution. So let's deal with the uh, entropic contribution first. So we luckily have our probability distribution that we previously worked with right here. So we derived that um, in that uh, ideal chain model. Now we can use, um, again, some basically combination of statistical mechanics and thermodynamics, and we could use this expression where entropy is related to what? The log of the number of microstates right here. And we know that the number of microstates is going to change as a function of N, the number of monomer units, and R. So that's what's going to kind of change here. Remember, as we plotted that probability distribution here, we can just see that's, that's where that function comes from. So the number of microstates is going to depend on N and R. So, uh, but typically, uh, we're going to have a fixed N. Uh, but that end-to-end -end distance might, uh, again, might change. <laughs> so, or actually will change. So, if we're looking at, again, the probability of finding a particular microstate with a particular N and a particular R, which, again, is that R squared end -to -end distance, you know, that R vector. If we're looking for the probability of finding or, you know, finding a particular microstate, it's just going to be that particular microstate divided by the integral of this, which is effectively the total, total number of microstates. So, again, that's always just kind of a probability. Probability of finding a particular microstate or a particular polymer with a particular n and a particular distance is just going to be div uh, divided by the total probability of finding all the polymers at all those different uh, configurations, uh, different monomer lengths and distance r. So, again, that's just math, so probabilities. So, we can then do some more complicated math. So we can use that expression that we just kind of talked about previously, k ln of omega. We saw that the probability as a function of n and r was equal to uh, basically this particular omega divided by, uh, divided by the integral of omega n and r dr. So we could rearrange this expression, solve for this, because again, we want to plug this into here, and just rewrite it in terms of p and then multiply by that integral here. So you could do that integral. Uh, this is just math at this point. You know, don't worry too much about it. But what you work with at the end there, so again, you could kind of rearrange, pull out this expression. So you could separate uh, those logs right here. And then once you plug in for the log of our exponential, because remember, p of n of r is equal to that. 1 over square root of 2 pi. Again, there's some pre-factors here. So if you look back, notes. Um, so there's some kind of constants here. But again, we don't care about uh, these values as long as they're not functioning as a, you know, uh, we don't care about those constants. We're looking at the scaling. So don't worry too much about, too much about that. Some of the constants are going to be thrown out, uh, and you'll kind of see that in that description uh, there. But anyways, uh, so you'll work with this uh, and use this expression of root by n squared. L squared exponential minus R squared over 2 uh, N squared L squared. Let's make sure that, that is correct. From the previous page, um, 3, let's get that factor there. 3, 2 pi, 3 halves. Anyways, uh, we're going to use that expression uh, <laughs> on the other page. Don't worry about that. But what we end up getting is a very, 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 uh, once we kind of simplify this down uh, and do the math out, we get a very critical expression here that our entropy, the entropy as a function of the number of monomers and R is this expression here. So it varies as a function of the ratio between the actual end-to-end -end distance R here and the R naught, which is your basically your end-to-end -end distance in a, you know, perfectly, uh, that NL squared, again, 
you saw that for an ideal chain, that R squared is equal to an L squared. That's your ideal chain. So that's this basically R naught. So R naught squared. So your R squared here is your actual end-to-end -end distance, just like kind of our alpha, right? We had the definition for alpha, which was this R squared divided by R naught squared. We're just taking out the averages here in the theta solid. That naught is equivalent to the theta here. So R naught is the basically the distance of an unperturbed or ideal chain in a theta solvent, R naught. So basically the same thing right here. And R is the actual end end distance of our chain in either a solvent or whatever the real you know, distance is. So now you might be asking, what about this uh, S sub N here? What is this? Well, that's a little bit um, basically more uh, kind of complicated. So it will also vary as a function of N. But we're going to see in a second that when we deal with free energies, we want to find like the equilibrium state of the system. So we're going to take the derivative with respect to R. So eventually this term is going to drop out. So ignore that for a second because it's going to disappear. Now, this is my free energy for my entropic component. What is my H or delta H? Well, it's going to be zero, right? We're working with uh, this ideal chain assumption. So this is going to be zero for that entropic uh, kind of uh, chain. So we're not going to have to worry about uh, those enthalpic components, uh, at least at this point. So it is not going to change as a function of just, you know, your monomer units here. Because that's, that's all we're considering, is the interaction between that monomer unit. So we're going to set H to zero, working on that ideal chain assumption. And then we are, uh, the other thing you'll notice is that this expression is only valid in tension. We'll get to, um, you could do the full uh, derivation, and I'd be happy to walk people through that for the tension. But let's look at this component for a second. So. If we have, we set H to zero because again, ideal chains, so we're not worried about um, basically any monomer monomer interactions uh, that are kind of different or that are going to be separate from zero. So the only thing that's happening in that entropic component is that we're going from an ideal state and we're pulling it apart. So we're going from this coil chain and we're extending it here. So there's going to be that restoring force pushing it back. How can we prove that mathematically? Well, look at G entropic. If I go, if my RMS distance, the, the length of my chain, if it is, if R squared is greater than R naught squared, what happens to my uh, G entropy? Or what changes? Uh, what is my G entropic? Or what's the change? So let's say I go from this state, from one to extended. So one to two. So what is my delta G entropic from going from basically one to two. What happens to my value? Well, initially, it's just going to be that three half kT, right? So k is your Boltzmann's constant. That has to be positive. T has to be positive. Again, we're working in Kelvin, so it must be positive. Uh, that entropy here, again, we don't have to worry about too much. That's also going to be positive. So what happens when I increase the size of my chain? Well, this G entropic, my total, you know, uh, when I switch from one to two, it increases, right? Like increasing that size, <laughs> increasing R, uh, making it greater than R naught, that increases my, and my, again, my free energy. That is that. So again, that's that driving force, right? So if I increase my entropy, that's not a favorable entropic energetic state. So my G entropy is increasing as my R increases. As I go and stretch it out from my ideal state, my entropy is increasing, my energy is increasing. Does that make sense? It's, again, exactly the same thing we've talked about you know, multiple, multiple times uh, in this course. So how can we, uh, again, the full derivation, I'm not going to go into it, but we can also write this term as for compression as well. So you'll notice that this is basically R naught squared. This is R naught squared. So you can see in tension, uh, the first term is really, really, really large, right? Because as I extend my chain, this term becomes huge. This term basically cancels out. But as my uh, if and vice versa for compression. So if I compress, if my R squared becomes really, really, really low, this guy gets canceled out and this one dominates and, you know, flows. Again, it's the same idea, right? It's this plus. It's adding. We're increasing, we're increasing our energy whether we pull our chain, extend it, or whether we compress it into kind of a point uh, in a black hole. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so any perturbation, uh, any deviation from that ideal state is going to reduce the number of possible microstates, and thus decrease entropy and increase our energy, increase our delta G, our delta G entropy. So that's the 
critical, critical, critical finding. Any deviation from that, um, any deviation from our ideal state, we obtain that, uh, we increase our energy, we decrease entropy, and that is not favorable energetically. So for our polymer chain, it's going to enforce that back here. Or if it's coiled up, it's going to force it to be pulled on. Again, that spring, it's going to kind of basically make it pop back or, you know, pop back into its original configuration. So I've also included, uh, basically from a statistical mechanics approach, uh, to kind of derive the same uh, idea. Again, you don't have to go through this uh, too in depth, but again, if you're a statistical mechanics uh, person and you like that, uh, we could definitely talk about it. So, uh, but yeah, that's it. So we've already taken care of, so our full delta G of swelling at two components was this entropic. So we've finished our entropic discussion. Now we need to get into our enthalp discussion. So I will see you all. Uh, next time. And yeah, we'll go ahead and tackle that then. Thanks. That's it. Bye.